Okay, let's get started. Thanks for joining us today, everyone. Today we'll be talking a little bit on computational fluid dynamics. Just a very basic overview, some applications of interest, um, and especially focusing on how lab testing data gathered and verified in our spray labs can help refine and add more value to our CFD models. Um, today joining us will be regional uh, spray specialist, Justin Berger out of uh, Houston, Texas area, and PhD researcher, Kyle Bade. He'll be joining us a couple minutes. He's having a little trouble getting in the Zoom link, but uh, Justin, why don't you start us off? Yeah, th thanks, Mary, so much. Uh, we're so privileged to be able to uh, to to be here, and uh, really appreciate all y'all's uh, y'all's time. And uh, Mary, if you could go ahead and get us uh, get us on the next slide. So today, what we're looking at is uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamics. Um, and many of us in the industrial world might see that term uh, thrown around quite a bit, but uh, we're really diving in today on what it is and how that can be leveraged for various spray applications. And what's fascinating is that CFD encompasses a large uh, gamut of various uh, processes and uh, different phenomenon. For example, you can look at fluid flow, heat transfer, mass transfer, chemical reactions, and uh, other pieces. And for us, we're really focusing in on uh, what happens to a droplet inside of a vapor stream. And that's really where it, it gets interesting. And there can be some very high competitive advantages uh, that can be gleaned from that. Okay, Mary, next slide. So getting into a bit as to why we use it, um, you know, oftentimes we're able to spray something in the lab and uh, visually, uh, even quant quantifiably, we can say, okay, this, this is great. We can translate this and it can go into a process. But uh, sometimes, let's say it's a refinery, a, a chemical plant, or a, another type of uh, application where it's too volatile to spray into the lab. And that's where CFD can come in. We can actually model what's happening and really help glean some deep insights into what's happening in your process. And uh, it, it's a pretty powerful resource with the right application. And so uh, next slide. So lab testing and CFD. So basically, uh, you know, any software package is equipped with computational fluid dynamics. And, uh, but where the difference lies, I'm gonna bring in uh, Dr. Kyle uh, Bay to, to speak with us a little bit on how we take our lab data and our insights that we have uh, for the physics of how droplets interact uh, within vapor streams and how we can kind of uh, get that mind and machine integration occurring. So Kyle, I'll let you uh, speak a little bit to the high level and then we'll get into some of the, the fun stuff. I think you're on mute there, Kyle. There you go. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, good morning. Thank you. So uh, what, we, what we do in our lab is something very unique. You know, modeling sprays is, is only as good as the data you put in, right? So we have a world-class laboratory where we're able to collect spray information, drop size, velocity, concentration, um, and then create these inputs for the spray models that we that allows us to to not model the the breakup, which is very complex and detailed, but but model the the progression of the spray through the process. So this is a really unique capability of bringing those two things together, both the lab work as well as the the modeling in the CFD. Yeah, Kyle, I, I really like uh, you know that integration, you know drop sizes, and we'll get into this a little bit. It's not a one singular drop size, and oftentimes the software uh, can make assumptions, and those assumptions can then lead to very different outcomes. And we'll speak to that uh, a little bit. Uh, Mary, next slide. So here's how this works. Uh, step one, we, we gather data from the lab, uh, from our lab grade instruments. And Kyle, can you describe kind of what we're looking at here uh, with this particular instrument? Sure, so this is a phase Doppler interferometer. And so what happens is 
Every droplet that passes through the intersection of these laser beams is, is characterized for size, velocity, and, and count, basically. So, so this is really rich data. You couldn't ask for anything more of, uh, than sizing and, and characterizing individual droplets, you know, 10,000 a second, 100,000 a second. There's, there's really not much of a limit here in terms of the sprays that we measure. And this allows us to, to collect that detailed data that goes into the models. Excellent. Yeah, and now the, the next piece. So before we had two intersecting lasers, and, and then what's this other instrument that you're showing us here? Sure. So in addition to the, the detailed individual droplet information, understanding the overall pattern and distribution of the spray is obviously very important. So uh, this is a laser sheet imaging uh, uh, picture, and we'll see some data in a few minutes here, in a few seconds. The but what it looks, allows us to do is decide how much information is in the center of the spray, how much spray is in the center of the plume versus the edges, what's the shape of that pattern, how wide is it spread out. And Kyle, on and this, then what we, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'll just, I'll jump right into this one. So this is, this is actually from the phase Doppler. And what we see here is, is diameter versus velocity. And so this allows us to look at the, any correlations between the size and, and, by, and velocity of individual droplets. Each one of these red marks is an individual droplet that's been characterized, which can then feed into an input uh, distribution or, or algorithm that goes into the CFD models. And Kyle, on this graph, it's a, it's a very powerful visual of uh, the velocities, right? So not only do we have differing drop sizes, but mm -hmm. with those drop sizes come different characteristics on how they travel through the environment, right? So what I'm understanding Absolutely. from graph, uh, can you describe what's happening with the velocity versus size and what we're yeah. seeing as that uh, is progressing? Right. Well, one of the things that happens in a spray is because you do have a wide range of droplet sizes, uh, larger droplets carry more momentum, right? And so as they exit the nozzle and move through the process, uh, larger droplets typically are moving faster, so they have a better chance of not only moving through the process and hitting walls, uh, but there might be uh, smaller droplets evaporating. But, but from this type of a plot, we can then determine what is the size velocity uh, uh, bias that you might experience across a spray pattern, where if at the edges of the spray, for example, you have smaller droplets, they may evaporate and, and coat, you know, be, be distributed more uniformly. But larger droplets that might exist in the center of the spray are going to persist further through the process and, and have a longer residence time. And that can have huge implications on these sensitive processes, right? That are uh, exactly to be considered black boxes, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mary, we can go to the next one. And this is another example of what we would see. And Kyle, go ahead and just uh, briefly describe what we're seeing on this graph and, and kind of- Yeah, this is, this is a more typical drop size distribution or uh, some people call the, the green lines here an S curve. It's, it's what volume of droplets contain, uh, what size of droplets contain the, the, the primary volume of the spray, right? So at the 50% line here across the middle is where 50% of the, the spray volume is contained of that size droplet and smaller. So if you're worried about where is your material going? And looking at a volume sense is, is what you want to do. So it's a powerful way of quantifying this. And this is these are mm -hmm. one of my favorites mm -hmm. uh, right here, Kyle. That you guys have done extensive work yeah. on. Yeah, go ahead and share. Yeah, this me. is the this is the laser sheet imaging results where we can really see the detailed 2D patterns of where is the spray located across the spray plume, right? And so this this highlights the fact that just because you have a nozzle that may be six inches or two feet wide. Um, that spray is not uniformly distributed across that pattern. And it's very important to understand that because if you're going to use uh, a single nozzle, you want to understand that near the edges, you might have less spray, for example. If you're going to use multiple nozzles, like you see in the, in the bottom uh, image here or the leftmost image here, when you have multiple nozzles, you really care about overlapping to make sure that you're utilizing your entire space, whether that's a conveyorized application or some type of a tower where you want to make sure that the entire volume of that tower is going to be be used to evaporate the sprays or condition the gases. Yeah, that's that's very powerful insight. You know, and, and then we go into the step three, which is where we get out of the lab and into the uh, conceptual modeling, right? And we, we plug in this information that uh, Dr. Kyle and his team aggregate, they validate, they certify this data. And then uh, from there, it transitions to our computational fluid dynamics team. And we're able to leverage that information in a very powerful way that, um, that very few labs are equipped uh, to, to handle. 
And so what we do is we, we take that information, then we start uh, throwing it into our model. And then uh, Mary, next slide. And we put everything together, right? So we, we got our lab grade instruments, we have our data, we pop that into a CFD model, and then we apply that CFD model into the real world processes. And what that does is it gets us closer and closer to understanding what's happening in the field and gives the client great feedback on adjustments. Let's say they might wanna push a turnaround out for a few months or weeks or uh, even a couple of years. These CFD studies can help uh, gain, give confidence on, uh, on, on how we can push that and start adding some value. Uh, next slide, Mary. So the big picture is by combining the testing uh, with our CFD, uh, they inform one another. We're able to get that feedback loop, right? With the software, uh, which is very powerful, very quantitatively uh, powerful. And then also with what Kyle and his team uh, are able to do is get that whole spectrum of that droplet. Rather than using an average or uh, estimates, we're, we're able to get true data plugged into that model. And that's where the true competitive and the true insights really start to, to happen at that, uh, that droplet level. And then we can then produce uh, solutions and then our methods just get uh, more robust as time goes on. Um, it's just a, this, this nice feedback loop that gets better and better and more refined with each iteration that we conduct. So next, we're gonna go into some uh, key applications. We're, we're gonna just talk about a few of them, and that way uh, you guys can start holding in your mind where CFD may be applicable and how it can start bringing some value uh, to, to your different operations that you have. So gas, quench, and cooling, uh, this is pretty important. So on this particular application, the goal was to get a incoming gas stream to a certain temperature. And so we were trying to get some rapid cooling to occur and uh, the client, it, it was exceptionally important that temperatures not exceed a certain parameter and also to get even cooling to reduce uh, thermal shock from different uh, pieces. And Kyle, whenever we're looking at something along these lines, can you describe how your drop size data might be benefit on the gas quench on the cooling aspect and why having that specific distribution is important to what we're trying to accomplish here? Right, and in these applications, the drop size is most critical. The balance of, of volume contained within the droplets to the surface area of the droplets is going to dictate how much interaction there is between the gas stream and the liquid droplets. And so uh, typically this is captured in a solder mean diameter or D32. And, and this is really a ratio, a diameter built off the ratio of the overall surface area to volume ratio of the, of the, uh, the spray distribution. So a smaller D32 or solder mean diameter is going to mean that there's more droplet surface area and more interaction happening within the process. And so is it safe to say that surface area kind of makes a, makes a difference as well with these types of applications? Absolutely. Absolutely right. It's uh, the surface area is everything, right? That's the interaction point between the gas and the liquid, right? So that's, that's going to be absolutely critical. Larger droplets are going to persist longer, but there's going to be more volume trapped inside of these, these droplets, right? And so you can think of like anything like a, whether it's a soccer ball or an M&M, &M, there's material inside of there and, and it cannot interact with what's outside of the, the shell until there's some evaporation or movement of the material. So, so the surface area of the droplets is what's dictating the speed of the, uh, the process. And, and it's inter intriguing, you know, the smaller we go, the bigger it becomes, right? And that's kind of a neat paradigm. And, and what we're looking at here is really the modeling. So right now we have uh, the gas velocity contours, and here we have the temperature contours of that same model. We can see what's happening from the very high heat and also what impact that spray concentration. So we're combating that heat with a high concentration on the front end. And then here we have uh, the ISO surface of what that spray plume actually looks like. You can see most of the work of the spray nozzles is happening at the very top, uh, that interaction. So that initial interaction is critical to uh, cooling at the speed that this client requires. And the faster we cool, the more product can either be run or uh, the, the less impact on upstream equipment as well. 
So even a, a drop size difference of a, a, a few microns uh, can yield some heavy competitive advantages on, on a process such as this. Uh, now we're going to move on to one of my favorite uh, applications just because it's, it's intriguing. And uh, oftentimes we see heat exchangers in a number of applications. And what's fascinating with uh, some of these studies that we have done is that the upstream uh, inlet gases make a huge difference on what's happening once uh, we hit the tube sheet. So for this specific application, there was fouling happening on the tube face, which is very common. And originally there was a nozzle that uh, was just perpendicular to the incoming gas stream. And uh, over time, the, the tube sheets got occluded and efficiencies went down. In fact, it was threatening to shut down the whole plant uh, because of those efficiencies. What we were able to do is uh, use that CFD study and enhance and understand where our boundary conditions should be. Because what we found is that upstream gas uh, had certain turns and bends well, that had exponential effects on what was happening within that gas stream. And then two, it was impacting uh, how the droplets behave before the droplets were all getting forced straight down to the bottom. And through that CFD study, we were able to position the nozzle in such a way and understand that we needed a different drop size to be able to overcome some of those momentum uh, that we were seeing in that tube sheet. And Kyle, uh, you know, for this, for getting good coverage, right, where we're trying to, uh, we, we, need that, uh, we need that velocity, we need that momentum to combat those physical forces of that uh, vapor stream that's traveling, you know, basically like 60 miles an hour, right? It's whipping through there. So how does your drop size analysis inform that CFD piece uh, from an accurate coverage standpoint? Sure. Well, this is this is where the the safety modeling really comes in, right? Because once we've collected those data in the laboratory, um, we get high quality, accurate information going in, and so the process modeling that then happens and tracks the evaporation, the trajectories, uh, all of this other application info through the process. That's where the CFD modeling is is, is absolutely critical, right? So if you've got a uh, a hazardous or high temperature application, we can't really test this type of thing, but we can model it, right? And track where the droplets are going, how fast they're evaporating, what's the interaction, um, what's the change in the chemistry as we move through the process. Uh, this is obviously, uh, this is everything, <laughs> you know, and this is, this is what leads to why, this, why the, uh, the process is effective or efficient or, or successful or unsuccessful. You know, and Kyle, you, you nailed it. And what's fascinating with the CFD, the, the marginal um, uh, inputs, right, the costs of the CFD versus shutting down the plant uh, are huge. And the insights that we can glean from saying, hey, based off of understanding what this one drop size is doing and understanding how it travels throughout all of that environment can lend itself to uh, keeping plants open, right? And it's something that simple that small, um, but very, very powerful. And that's where that CFD and that technical piece of understanding the individual droplets uh, come in. Uh, next slide. Absolutely. This is another fun one, uh, SNR, SNCR. So government regulations require uh, NOx reduction. And you can see that we're able to model all kinds of fun things, seeing the gas streams, we can see our PPM of what's happening with the NOx as well as the vapor streams. And here, drop size is very important, but it's also important to get full interaction. And, and Kyle, kind of speak to that. These nozzles typically, they could be too fluid uh, in, in all likelihood. And with that too fluid nozzle, you know, we're getting certain characteristics. Uh, what advent advantages are gleaned from something like this with drop size and between that CFD? Right, right. So. You, know, you can imagine that CFD has been around for a long time and, and modeling the gas flow is absolutely critical. You don't want large recirculation regions or dead regions within the process. And, and, and that needs to be modeled as an initial uh, effort with any CFD project. But uh, what we can provide both in the lab as well as our experience in modeling the spray portion and the droplet portion is what's really unique about what spraying systems can do. Um, you know, the lab data we've touched on, but the CFD experience with with these types of things working with the commercial companies to create better code new 
new ways to handle sprays so that these application models are, are accurate is, is absolutely critical. Yeah, and, and being able to understand the nuance, uh, particularly for SNR, SNCR, those uh, environmental dings can be uh, very, very high, you know, for something that's very, very simple to overcome uh, with getting some extra belt and suspenders behind what's happening and how to find one of some of those risk points that we might want to look at. You know, for example, you see these recirculation zones. Well, perhaps we let those straighten out and we pop in a little bit higher uh, and adjust our drop size so it's smaller and we get a faster reaction. Um, but there's, there's a lot of pivots that can be done here. Uh, we're going to go on to the next one, which is actually pretty fun, um, uh, the fluid structure interaction. And this is important too, uh, familiar a bit with refineries. There's some high velocities going in there with some injection points. And uh, Kyle, kind of describe what we're seeing here and uh, what we don't want to happen. Yeah, you know, this adds a whole nother element. You, you talk about gas flow, you talk about sprays. Well, now we're talking about the hardware itself, right? And so um, you can imagine that anytime there's a spray or a gas flow pushing on, on a piece of hardware, stress analysis is obviously critical in that, in that uh, evaluation. Uh, for you know even more than that is the interaction with the structure and the fluid around it right and so as they like, say the gas passes around a, a, an injector like this you can if if it just so happens that that shedding frequency aligns itself with the natural frequency or near, near the natural frequency of the of the, the hardware itself of the lance you can get some pretty severe vibrations and even breakage and justin's got an example here of a of a lance that did fail or an injector that did fail and so what you see in the images on screen is, is actually uh, an exaggerated view, but a view of how much bending can actually occur. Uh, and we, we see these types of failures. And so you, know, you can do a few things. You can adjust the diameter of the injector, for example, to manage that, that shedding frequency. You can add a, a fin, like in the top, top right image here, where a fin was added to both change the shedding frequency and increase the structural integrity of the, the overall injector. So uh, modeling these stresses along with the the gas flow surrounding it and the, the spray reactionary forces is obviously a very complex uh, combination of, of many different types of models. Yeah, you, you nailed it. And I love these studies because eventually the end product, it ends up looking like a rocket ship. So uh, it's, it's kind of fun with those fins when they get on there and you get to combine right. neat physics behind it. So yeah, th thanks for that, Kyle. Yeah, fluid structure interaction, pretty important, and it's something that's often missed um, as a risk. And a lot of times you can get by without it. Other times we see things that uh, that can clink off into a process that might, uh, might not be too, too advantageous. So, uh, Mary, we can go on to the next one. Next piece is our, our spray drying. And, you know, what's fascinating with spray dry is a lot of things are made of it and maybe not a lot of folks are aware, you know, you can think of Tang, uh, baby formula, all your little protein powders, uh, many pharmaceutical applications for your active ingredients, uh, all flow through spray dry technology. And uh, again, droplet size is very important. Typically you're spraying a, a, a slurry through here and you have uh, your active ingredient and then your carrier. So that carrier comes through and it does some fun stuff, but you need a small droplet so that way it evaporates out. And then you get this nice, fine, dry, consistent powder at the end of this. And, and Kyle, based off of your experience, you, you've worked with a few spray dry nozzles in the past. Um, Just a few. What, <laughs> what happens <laughs> when these nozzles uh, wear out, right? Let, let's kind of go the other direction. Yeah. And a lot of these materials are, are very abrasive, right? And so as they flow through the nozzle, the orifices, the passageways can really change and can change really quickly. You know, you could be talking on a matter of hours, depending on the materials that the nozzles construct out of and what's flowing through it. So, um, or, or sometimes much, much longer, but, but understanding how that change may occur is something we can, we can actually test for in the lab, some, some accelerated wear tests. Uh, but we've also done programs where a, a, a client may, use a nozzle that we think will be best for some amount of time and then they can send it back to the, the spray lab to be tested both before the new nozzle is sent out as well as after uh, it's been used for that amount of time. So this sort of testing program is a way to get some real world understanding of how much effect ha has occurred. Yeah, it, you know, one application that I'm familiar uh, with, we get to play with steel mills uh, a, a little bit here and there and it's going to that wear idea 
you know, nozzles are, are spectacular, but the second you start flowing through them, uh, things change. Uh, your, your fluid uh, amount of fluid going through, or you have abrasiveness. And we are equipped to help you guys understand that nuance throughout the, the life cycle of that nozzle. And uh, by doing so, that can yield you competitive advantages, more planned uh, outages, and also mitigate some of your QAQC challenges as well. And we can combine all of that fun with, uh, again, with CFD and other prediction models just to inform us and uh, get us a little bit uh, get a little bit more competitive and more fruitful with the resources we have. So yeah, uh, next slide, Mary. So kind of putting this all together, uh, you know, we discussed uh, how the lab is so important to validating uh, these CFD models. And uh, Dr. Kyle and his team uh, are, are best in class at using the proper science, the proper science behind uh, characterizing these droplets uh, in a lab setting and really bridging that mind and machine uh, chasm, right? So the software is great. It's a wonderful tool. But as Kyle mentioned, uh, it's only as good as the data that we feed it. And the off-the-shelf data that is provided may be adequate. Um, however, whenever it's a sensitive process, uh, that's that's where we really uh, shine and are able to get to that next step. And uh, you, you're able to get the most amount of uh, accuracy out of what you're doing. So uh, bottom line is your, your ROI is there. You get deeper insights. And two, collectively, uh, the best part about running these CFD studies with the teams and our clients is they now have a similar mental model of what's happening. Whereas before, you know, oh, we're going to stick a nozzle here and who knows what happens, that mental model changes. Um, and Kyle, you, you've seen this before, too, I'm sure, even in spraying different liquids, right, of uh, the, the light bulb goes off. Oh, wow, this, this behavior mm -hmm. differently. Um, mm -hmm. So if you want to speak a little bit to that as well. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's always uh, adjustments that need to be made and, you know, Kathleen Brown's our lead CFD engineer, and she's online here too. If there's more detailed questions, but uh, you know, I'm more of a lab guy <laughs> here on the CFD talk. But that, you know, that's uh, absolutely true. Whether it's testing or CFD, you know, you need to be able to have a wide range of tools to to make adjustments that is necessary, right? And, and to use the best tool for the job and understand what you're seeing uh, as the the test or the model is progressing, so you can you can make sure that it's going to be accurate all the way through. Yeah, yeah, thank, thanks, Kyle. And uh, yeah, you brought up a good point. We do have C, uh, our, our CFD uh, head as well, Kathleen Brown, and we'll pop on another webinar of a, a bit more detail on the CFD side, and we'll let you guys know when that will be available. And uh, Mary, we can hit the next slide. So really, guys, uh, we just wanted to give you an overview of uh, CFD, what the differences are, how we're able to take the lab data, integrate that into the real world, and again, fusing that mind machine interface and, and two, how we like to, uh, we like to co-create with, with our clients. And it's through that collaboration where, where the, uh, the true competitive advantages come to light. Um, so with that, we just ask that you guys uh, contact us at uh, spray.analysis at spray.com. Uh, visit our spray analysis website, virtual events and webinars, and then two, follow uh, the spray analysis group as well as uh, connect with me on LinkedIn and, and take a look through, uh, feel free to prove some of my connections. There might be some other collaborations that can occur. And then uh, watch our little YouTube page. Uh, we're, we're starting to get things out of the lab and into your hands a bit more. And uh, we'll be updating that on, on a regular basis. But uh, with that, we're, we're happy to take any um, written questions that might be out. So we're right at that 1030 mark. but um, there's anything out there, Mary, if you could. Uh, Justin, I just want to add to, um, yeah. you know, what we've shown today shows a wide range of applications, but mm -hmm. most of what we do in the modeling area is proprietary, right? There's a lot of geometry and information that can't be shared. So um, for anyone watching that, that is concerned about that or has questions about it, that's absolutely within the norm for us to work under an NDA, uh, keep everything proprietary and handle things carefully. So if there's any questions about that, it, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, that, that's good, Kyle. That's a pretty big, um, uh, pretty big piece that we, we deal with regularly. Uh, let's see, I see a question here. Can, can we use TFD for humidification applications like uh, 
wind hoses used in car manufacture? Uh, I, I would say absolutely. I mean, CFD is great for anything uh, where, where fluids, gases, anything is interacting there. And, um, you know, as long as there's a, uh, a market and a need to understand what's happening, uh, CFD could, could be a, a very powerful tool for that. Absolutely. You can see those temperature gradients. Okay, we got another question. What is the maximum spray density on a mass basis that we've simulated? That's a great question. And I think, see, uh, good thing. Kathleen, uh, are you on the line here? Sorry, yeah, I'm here. Um, most of what you're seeing here is DPM model, um, which even with the dense DPM, 20% is about the limit. Um, if you go beyond that, we have to move to a different type of model, which is a VOF, which certainly we have done, um, but it's much more intense and um, it takes a whole lot more detail and time to uh, get to answers there. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I see Dr. Ciro, your question, uh, typical cost and time to complete. I can say cost varies based off of our, our boundary conditions. And uh, you're looking at gas cooling and uh, SNCR. We're happy to uh, kind of look at what those boundary conditions are and uh, get you a proposal. We're happy to look at that for you. As far as uh, the time and iteration, Kathleen, what's our, uh, our throughput looking for a, uh, a basic CFD study? Nothing, you know, uh, standard iterations. Um, uh, with everything defined up front. Yeah, our, our standard time is three to four weeks. Um, if it's highly complex, it may take a little bit more. Um, if we're looking at, like you said, a lot of times when you're looking at a process, it varies. So you're gonna look at a minimum and a maximum. So it's, it's more than one and it may go a little bit longer than that, but I, I would say standard time, three to four weeks. Perfect. Okay, I have one more question coming in. Um, what software do you recommend for CFD analysis? Yeah, Kathleen, I'll let you, you speak to that one as well. Um, here we primarily use ANSYS products. Um, we, we dabble in OpenFoam uh, a bit. Um, it's, it's much more uh, detailed to get through, but uh, ANSYS is, is um, you know, one of one of the major packages is it's out there. It's very comprehensive. Um, we've had uh, pretty good success with it, um, and also it allows you to add user-defined functions to add um, some of the detail that you may find missing in in the basic components. Um, but it is uh, very comprehensive and covers more than most of the other uh, products that are out there. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Kathleen, and. I uh, got another one, Kathleen, for you. The droplet interaction, splash modeling, and coalescence. Um, he's asking, how do we, what droplet interaction are we employing for that? Uh, droplet interaction, it depends. Um, if you're talking about at the walls, if you're talking with other particles, um, that's really a complex uh, thing. As far as coalescence, um, if we're looking at sprays, generally sprays have droplets that are heading away from each other. So coalescence generally is not necessary to include and has very small effects unless you're in a very small space with a whole lot of nozzles aimed in similar directions. Um, as far as splash modeling, uh, it, it depends. Um, you really have to look at, at what you're doing um, how close you are to the walls, what types of walls you're, uh, that, that depends. And as far as wall models, uh, we actually generally employ three different uh, wall conditions so that we can look at uh, both a very conservative approach and a very, or at least a more realistic approach. And, and we combine them in the report. So we actually look at multiple uh, wall interactions. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks for that. And we, we've got another question in saying, uh, do we have a sample report that shows 
CFD uh, deliverables. And what we'll do, uh, Mary, at the, with all the attendees, we'll send over a, a synopsis of what we discussed as, as well as a sample report as what we typically include. Again, each project is unique, but there are, uh, there, there are common notes within each project that are, are very standard. Yeah, we also have some resources available on SprayAnalysis.com. Um, we have a few CFD studies there that we've um, done for research papers, and that'll give you some really similar results to what we would give to a customer. Perfect. Yeah, and I, I see another question from Alejandro, a general template of, of what we require. You know, I, I, I would suggest starting that conversation with your local sales engineer, uh, and, and then from there, uh, be able to understand what boundary conditions we're looking for and uh, what exactly the goal of that CFD study would be. But uh, to answer your question, Aleander, yeah, there, there are a few uh, common pieces that are required for uh, providing those proposals. Yeah, we, we do have some templates for the information that's required in the general process that we can send along as well. Perfect. All right. Any other uh, questions? Ah, yes, we, we did record the presentation. Yep. All right. Well, we really appreciate all of your time. Uh, we will follow up with some information. And we will get you guys uh, uh, in, the, in the loop on any of the new technologies that we develop and uh, start having some more fun. Uh, thank you so much.